I am so grateful and excited to open up God's word this morning and study it together and see what the Lord is going to teach us. For those of you who don't know me, I'm, my name is uh, Josh Martin. I'm the next gen pastor over students here at Christ Place. And I wanna thank Pastor Jeff for this opportunity um, to step up here and teach from God's word this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open them up to the book of First Kings. We're gonna be in First Kings. Kings, really chapters 11 through 14, but we're going to spend the bulk of our time in chapter 12, 1 Kings chapter 12. Now this morning we're continuing our sermon series titled The Kings. Now before we get into this week's sermon, I want to recap where we have been to get to this point. We started off this series by seeing that God established Israel his people to be a theocracy, basically to have himself as the king over all of his people. Nation of Israel didn't like that. They saw everyone else around them have kings. So they said, we want a king. So God grants that request and brings forth Saul. We know Saul doesn't really pan out. So God anoints David to be king. And we see David have all of these victories through his life. Scripture calls him a man after God's own heart. But unfortunately, we also see the tragic downfall of David when we learn about David and Bathsheba several weeks ago. Now, what's wonderful about the life of David is we see him repent and turn back from that sin, but we see the consequences of it as David's family tree really begins to fall apart. And then last week, Pastor Andrew discussed King Solomon, how we see King Solomon start off so well, so strong where he asks God for wisdom. And because he asks God for wisdom, God grants him wealth and riches and status and power. He's able to build the temple for the Lord. Uh, Israel has peace and prosperity. But then Solomon too steps into foolishness. He marries uh, pagan wives and brings them in as queens and they bring in their religions and their worship and their pagan ideologies. And this morning we take, uh, take a look at his son, Rehoboam. We see Solomon's son, Rehoboam, unfortunately fall into the same exact cycle and example as those before him. You see, if we study Rehoboam today, you will see this, that he is a perfect example of everything not to do, not just as a leader, but also as a follower of the Lord. Now, as we look at Rehoboam, we're gonna be talking about this concept this morning of platforms, of platforms. Now, when I say platform, obviously I don't mean a physical structure such as a ladder or scaffolding. Really, when we say platforms, what we're talking about is Influence is influence. You know, many people today uh, all across the world and in our country, we use our our platforms for for many things, right? If you wanna see somebody using a platform to communicate something or push an agenda or talk about ideals, just hop online, right? Scroll through your social media feed, go watch the news. You know, in recent uh, history, we have Olympic athletes using their platform to communicate or take a stand. All sorts of athletes have been doing that for for several years now. You know, we can use our platform to communicate and promote wonderful things. I think of uh, like the End It movement, if you're not familiar with that, it's a movement to end sex trafficking. We can use our platforms to communicate things like that. But we can also use our platforms to communicate uh, not, necessarily, not necessarily evil or terrible things, but just some things that aren't good or aren't positive or beneficial. When I think about platforms, I'm gonna get tired of saying that word. When I think about platforms though, I can think about the platform that you may have like in your friend group. Now, growing up, I had the same group of friends really from the time I was in preschool all the way till now we still live around this area, which is awesome. It's such a a blessing and a privilege. Now in every friend group, you have uh, the influencers and then the influenced, right? Now, if you are a, in your friend group, uh, you may be known as what I would term a doer, Right? Now, here's the thing about doers. We love doers because you generally will do anything you're asked for a laugh, right? Or for personal entertainment. And um, I was never a doer. I was the platform person that came up with the stupid idea to communicate to the doer to 
do for personal enjoyment, right? Usually, well, actually every time at the other person's expense. Um, I can remember one time when I was in sixth grade, we were over, me and two of my best friends were over at one of the best friend's house. Parents weren't there and we were bored like sixth grade boys often get. And uh, me being the platform influencer person had this bright idea of what can we do? What can we do to entertain ourselves that wouldn't get us in too much trouble and obviously isn't illegal? So my first thought was uh, we walked past their laundry room and I saw the dryer and I thought that could be fun. And so uh, I had a doer of a best friend, again, grateful for him because I have all of these wonderful sermon illustrations. If it wasn't for him, my life would have been terribly, terribly boring. And so um, I, we went to the doer of the friend and we began to sales pitch him on the idea of us putting him in the dryer. And uh, he said, I will do it on one condition. Okay, what's the condition? Don't turn it on. So we proceed to fold my friend up like an accordion, like paper mache, get his little sixth grade frame in there with a flashlight and his like old Nokia, like silver flip phone. This was back in 2005 or six. So smartphones hadn't come out. We said, we'll put you in here. And our one condition is you film the whole thing. Great. <laughs> and so uh, we get him in there and we're talking with him. How is it in there? It's a little cramped. Okay. Hey, what's it look like? Well, it's dark. Okay, awesome. And so uh, then we get bored with that. We still haven't let said friend out of the dryer and we see the start button. Uh -oh. Now being sixth grade boys, we didn't know how to operate the dryer. So for all we know, it could have been on high heat. <laughs> he came out wrinkle free though, I'll say that. <laughs> but uh, so we turn it on and all of a sudden that dryer roars up like a jet engine and it's just moving around. I mean, it sounds like a bomb is going off in their laundry room and all we hear is this like, ba-boom, ba-boom. And in between the booms, there's this, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and so we frantically, we're pushing all the buttons. Finally, it stops, right? Again, he comes out smelling wonderful. And uh, we bring him out and we don't ask him if he's okay. We don't care if he's okay. Our one question was this, did you get the whole thing on video? <laughs> yeah. Now, we don't have that video, obviously, because that was however many years ago and those phones are, are uh, well, he doesn't have that, that phone anymore. But I'll tell you this, it was basically like our own little Blair Witch Project. It was super dark. And every now and then you saw a flash of light in my friend's face looking terrified. I'm like, this is, this is <laughs> fantastic. Now, another place that um, I can think personally of having a platform, if you are an older sibling, you have a platform with your younger siblings. Again, uh, sometimes for positive influence, other times for sheer fun and enjoyment. Um, the house that my parents live in now, we moved into when um, I was summer of my third grade year. So my younger sister was in second grade. And being the typical big brother, uh, I, <laughs> I had my sister convinced that uh, George Washington was buried underneath our house. And <laughs> He was mad that we disturbed him. And so he was haunting our house. And um, it was great until it backfired in the whole first year she slept in my room. I'm not joking about that either. Uh, here's the thing is we, we all have influence, right? We all have a platform to be used either for good or for bad. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how big or small that platform may be. We all have a platform and the one central truth I want us to grasp this morning is this. If you're taking notes, you're going to want to write this down. It's this, God gives you a platform to put him on. God gives you a platform to put him on. God gives me a platform to put him on. No matter how big that platform may seem, no matter how small it may seem or insignificant, God gives every single one of us a platform to put him on. On. Now to, to see this with, with Rehoboam, I want us to look back at 1 Kings chapter two. You don't have to turn there, it'll be on the screen. 1 Kings two, verse four. Now this is David at his dying breath, communicating to Solomon. He says this, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me saying, here's the Lord's words. If your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Now, what is David communicating to Solomon that the Lord had told him? He's basically telling Solomon this, Solomon, if you will put God at the center of everything you do, if you will keep God on the platform that he has given you, you will live a blessed life and live out the calling that God has placed on you. But unfortunately, we know this, 
We know David struggled with it. We know Solomon epically failed at this. And we're going to see that even David's grandsons and future generations would step into this perpetual cycle of never putting God on the platform that he had given them. You see the unraveling of David's family kind of started after his sin and accelerated under Solomon. But as we study Rehoboam this morning, we see this church that the full wrath of God on the line of David would be poured out on Rehoboam. And as we study him and the platform God gave, gave him, we're going to see three truths this morning. But before we get into that, I wanna spend some time in prayer and ask for God to bless the teaching of his word. So in this room and online, if you will bow your heads and close your eyes, we're gonna pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the incredible time of worship that we've had. God, I pray that you will just, uh, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit, that this isn't my message, Lord, but it's yours. That God, every single one of us in this room, myself included, will have soft hearts that are ready to respond in obedience to to whatever you teach us this morning. I pray that each one of us will self-diagnose, Lord, the, uh, the platforms that you have given us. And God, understand the importance of placing you on those platforms. God, I pray that your name is honored and glorified by everything that takes place. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. If you're taking notes this morning, the first point we're going to see is this. God gives you a platform. God gives you a platform. Now, that may seem like a nod-duh statement given everything we've talked about, but I really do want to flesh this out. Because you see, Rehoboam was given a massive platform. Not just because he was the king of Israel, he was giving a massive platform. Look in our scripture at 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 43, it says this, and Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. Well, you may be thinking, where do we get platform out of this? This is just teaching us that Solomon kicked the bucket and now Rehoboam is king. But we have to understand what Rehoboam got in being king. Remember Solomon, wisest man ever, right? He made Israel uh, massively wealthy, ton of prosperity, peace in the land, all sorts of things like that. Now, Rehoboam inherits all of this. He inherits the wealth, the riches, the peace, the status, the power, everything that Solomon had was now given down to Rehoboam. You can also imagine he probably had the best education, the best mentorships, the best anything that you could have to develop into a man or a leader. Rehoboam had access to it all. And in this moment, he was king. Rehoboam was given an incredible platform. Now we've used this word platform a lot this morning and and I wanna explore what that is. But in order to explore what it is, I wanna talk about what it isn't, right? When we talk about platform, we talk about influence, but here's what a platform is not, okay? Just so nobody tunes out this morning. A platform is not just having a ton of money. It's not status. It's not just reputation. You don't have to have a certain threshold of followers on social media to have a platform. You don't have to be an athlete to have a platform or be the smartest or prettiest or best looking or whatever it is. Every single one of us are given platforms. How do we know? Because if there are people in your life in which you have influence in their life, guess what? You have a platform. You have a platform. And it's so important, church, this morning that we understand this, that that platform that we have or platforms, they're not ours. They're given to us by God to put him on them. You know, I was reminded of a, uh, an older sitcom, I say older, maybe 20, 30 years old, where um, the girl comes home from school and apparently she's been picked on that her family's rich. I'm like, how do you get picked on for being? Anyway, so she comes home and her parents are sitting at the dining room table and she says, mom, dad, am I rich? And you can tell that the parents are puzzled by her question. And um, they're like, why do you ask? They're like, well, so-and-so, so-and-so said I'm rich. And um, the father in his like stoic, very like dry sense of humor is just staring at the daughter and quickly reminds her, he goes, no, you're not rich. Your mom and I are rich. And then looks her in the eyes and says, you have nothing. You own nothing. And now being a parent, I think about Audrey. Audrey's like, that's Audrey's. And I'm like, that's not Audrey's. You own nothing. She's like, but it's a pink hairbrush, doesn't matter. 
It's not Hodges, right? In the same way, God has gifted us the platforms that we have, not because we own them or earn them, but because he has chosen to do so. One truth we can see in this is simply this church. When we try to own our platform, eventually our platform will own us. How many people have we seen or known? They live their life for the platform that God has given them and eventually their platform eats them alive. When we own our platform, our platform will own us. You see, if you have influence in someone's life, God's given you a platform. If you have a talent or ability, God's given you that platform. When I think about this practically, I think about how one, I'm a husband, I have a platform with my wife too. I'm a father, I have a platform with my kids. I have a platform in my workplace. I have a platform among my my friend group. You see, this morning, if you're a parent in this room, I wanna kind of take a little aside here. I want you to understand this. Your greatest platform is the family you go home to every single day. It's not in your workplace. It's not just in the small group. My first and foremost platform in life is with my daughter, Audrey, and my son, Beckett. Uh, My wife has started uh, potty training last week's rephrase. My wife has not, my wife is potty trained. (laughs) 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 Clarify that for anybody who was confused. (laughs) Whoops. Um, My wife has started potty training our daughter, last week. Makes much more sense now. And um, first time Audrey, you know, used the restroom in her little uh, toddler potty, um, she wanted to FaceTime me. And I was, you know, understanding that the platform or trying to learn and understand the platform I, I have as a young dad and of little kids. As I looked at her in the little face, I'm like, good job, Audrey. I'm so proud of you. And anytime I'm at home and she goes in her little uh, toddler potty, she'll like jump up and be like, daddy, daddy, daddy. And I go over and I get down on her level and I get, she gives me a high five. And I'm like, great job, Audrey. I'm so proud of you. And, and I was reminded of the power and influence and the platform that dads we have, moms we have, that now when Audrey goes, she stands up and she goes, yay. And I'm like, good job. And then Audrey goes, I'm proud of you, daddy. And I'm like, I didn't do anything, <laughs> woo. But, but the point is this, parents in the room or anybody with a platform is that that platform is powerful. The words we use are powerful. And I've been reminded of the influence and the platform I have as a dad and as a parent. I wanna ask you this question this morning, what platform has God given you? What platform has God given you, sir? What platform has God given you, ma'am, or young person or kid in this room? And then my next question is this, are you putting him on that platform? Are you using it to boast up yourself? Because God gives you and I a platform to put him on on that platform. Rehoboam was given an incredible platform by God. Each of us have been given incredible platforms by God. And the question is this, what do we do with it? Let's look at Rehoboam. Our second truth this morning is this, your choices will build or destroy the platform God has given you. The choices you and I make will either build up or completely wreck the platforms that God has given us. No matter how big or how small our platforms are, they can be very fragile things. You know, you have that saying that talks about how trust is built over a lifetime and lost in a moment. It's the same thing with the platforms God gives us. They can be completely lost and crumbled down in a moment. Our choices will either build our platforms and influence or destroy them. And we unfortunately, we know <laughs> Rehoboam followed in the pattern of those before him, and he ends up making the wrong choices. Look at me at verse six, says this, then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men. Let's pause here, what's going on? So uh, up to this point, Solomon, Rehoboam's dad, has been unfairly treating the people of the Northern tribes of Israel, taxing them unfairly, using them for more labor, that type of thing. Um, we see in Kings, 1 Kings chapter 11, that God appears to a man named Jeroboam, or excuse me, speaks to a man named Jeroboam and basically promises that you will be king of Israel. Now, when he says Israel, he means the 10 Northern tribes. So Solomon hears of this, 
Jeroboam flees to Egypt. Now, when uh, Rehoboam becomes king, Jeroboam makes his way back to Israel and Rehoboam makes his way out to the people to kind of make a first appearance as the king. It's really a, a political play, almost like campaigning here. And so the people of the Northern tribes, they send Jeroboam, their champion before Rehoboam, it's a bunch of Boams. And he's, he says to uh, Rehoboam, hey, your dad made our life miserable. Will you please not do that? So that's basically what he says. So Rehoboam says, come back in three days and I'll give you my answer. And here's where we are in verse six. So he first takes counsel with the old men who stood before Solomon, his father, while he was yet alive saying, how should I answer the people? Verse seven. And the old men say to him, if you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But transition to verse eight, if you've got a paper copy of God's word or whatever you want to highlight or underline these three words, it says this, but he, he being Rehoboam, but he abandoned. He didn't like what he heard. He didn't like the answer he received. So what does he do? He goes and he seeks out counsel with the young men who had grown up with him. Now I wanna pause here because there's some awesome biblical truths. I want us to first see the voices that Rehoboam has, the voices speaking into his life. The first voice that we see in chapter six is the old and the wise. He goes to the older men who had no doubt uh, been through all sorts of political plays, political dramas. They have the wisdom and the counsel and they give him great advice. He doesn't like what he hears, so what does he do? He goes and finds another voice that he does agree with and he seeks out the counsel of the young and the foolish. Here's a truth here this morning. If you are a young person in the room, I consider myself a young person, I'm only 27. If you're a young person in the room, you need to find a godly individual, man or woman that can speak truth and wisdom and biblical counsel into your life. I know you're a middle schooler and you think your middle schoolers are wise. I put a friend in the dryer in sixth grade. Don't come to me for life advice, you know? Or you're a college student, there's nothing wrong with having peers that, that walk alongside you, but it's so crucial to have individuals that are more seasoned in life and more experienced in life that can pour into you. Um, I think of uh, Pastor George Thomas, and he was in the last service. He's preached here several times. I think he's preaching in the upcoming weeks. And um, when he first came here to Georgia, he and Miss Sandra moved here. Um, he spoke to all of our staff, kind of like a leadership luncheon type thing. And he talked about how he had just retired from ministry and all these things. And I remember thinking, I'm about to get this man out of retirement. Like this man is, he doesn't even be just going to the lake. And so he gives us his email. And, um, and I, not two hours later, I email Pastor George, introduce myself. I say, would you be interested in mentoring me? And I didn't know if I was gonna get a yes or a no. I'm not like super like outgoing. So I'm like, this was a big deal for me to even reach out to him. And he emails back and he says, yes. We met for breakfast once a week, every week for about a year and a half. And I can tell you this as a young person, young people take this from me. I am a better man, husband, father, pastor, leader, communicator. And the list goes on and on and on because of the year and a half that I spent with Pastor George. But the other side of this coin is this. Pastor George, as an older man, older generation, you know what? He was available. He was available and willing. So young people, we've got to humble ourselves and admit that we don't know everything and look for wisdom and advice from the older generation. And guess what? Older generation, we need you. You've gotta be willing to say yes. You've gotta be willing to take time to pour into the younger generation. So we don't make the mistakes that you made. We don't make the mistakes that you've seen play out. Can you imagine what would have happened had Rehoboam listened to the older men who said, dude, this isn't a good decision. We've seen this play out before. How would this story have played out completely different? Understand this. Older generation, you don't know whose life trajectory you can change just by having your yes on the table. You have no idea the ripple effect of impact that you can have by having your yes on the table. So we first see the voices, the old and the wise and the young and the foolish. But we also see his choices. Verse seven, the older men, they basically tell him this. If you will serve these people and offer them a kind word, they will be your servants forever. They give him the leadership advice of this. 
serve and encourage. Rehoboam, you wanna have a platform with these people? You wanna lead these people? You wanna have a successful reign as the king? Serve and encourage. He doesn't like that. So he goes to the young and the foolish, his dumb, dumb friends. And here's what they say. Show him who's boss. Show him who's boss. Look at verses 10 and 11. They say this. You shall say to the people who asked you this question, your father made our yoke heavy, but lighten it for us. Here's what you should say to them. My little finger is thicker than my father's thigh. That's a weird phrase. <laughs> I almost said weird flex, but that'd be even worse. Now, verse 11, and now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I'm gonna add to it. My father disciplined you with whips. Now, a whip being a single cat tail whip, but I will discipline you with scorpions, not the little critters. That would have been bad enough. A scorpion was a whip that had eight to 12 cat tails on it. So he's basically saying, my dad made your life miserable. You don't even know how good you had it under my dad. I'm about to make it even worse. Serve and encourage or show them who's boss. Don't miss this leadership principle here. If God has given you any kind of leadership role or just in general as a platform, you ready? We want to know biblically how to to be blessed in the platform God has given us. Serve and encourage those with whom God has given you the platform. Serve and encourage. Platforms are not grown by keeping people under a, a heavy thumb or by hammering them down all the time. It is grown by serving and encouraging. So he gets this sound advice. Well, what does he do? (laughs) He listens to what he wants to hear, tells the people he's going to make their lives worse. And what happens? The kingdom of God splits and begins to crumble. God's people, the kingdom of Israel splits and begins to fall. I ask you this question, church, this morning is this, what influences are you listening to in your life? Is it your social media feed, news channel, your friends, family? Understand this, who or what we listen to will shape who we become. Who and what we listen to always shapes who we become. Pastor says this all the time, show me your friends and I will show you your future. Who and what we allow to influence us, who we listen to will shape who we become. You see, our choices have a profound and massive impact on the platforms that God has given us. We must always choose to put him on the platform. When I was in high school growing up here, I played soccer at Johnson High School. There's a guy who is a year older than me, phenomenal athlete. I mean, just a stud of an athlete. Ran like a almost 10 minute, two mile. I was back at like the 16 minute mark type thing. And super fast, technically gifted, basically had colleges beating down his door to come play soccer there. And um, he, he, he and I were close. Um, I can't remember if he had a relationship with Jesus at that time or not. I think he did. Um, And then rededicated later on in life. But the point is this, he kept saying, Hey, I want to play in college. I want to go pro. I want to do all these things. I kept saying, why do you want to do those things? He said, because I want to use it for, for God's glory. Okay. Well then what are you using your platform for now? How are you using your current platform for God's glory? He could never answer me. And a conversation would come up over and over and over and over and over again. Um, Senior year rolls around, right? Senior year rolls around. And and I knew that he was not using this platform for for God's glory. He was using it for his own. Senior year rolls around. Three weeks into the season, completely destroys his knee. Gone. Like college scholarships, gone. Future (laughs) in the sport, gone everything ripped away in a single moment. He comes to me and he says, why did this happen? I said, one, I I can't give you a definite answer. Um, I'm not very compassionate. So he comes to me and I'm like, there, there. (laughs) Sorry, buddy. The part I was good at was the, I told you so, (laughs) man, I I told you so. I said, look, here's what I know, dude. We can push God's buttons for so long before he rips everything out from underneath us. I said, man, I'm afraid pushed it. You pushed it. God gave you a platform. You didn't put him on it. So what does he do? He yanks the platform out from underneath you. And I wonder how many of us this morning have a platform that is teetering on the brink of destruction because we refuse to put God on the platform he's given us. You see, the choices we make will either build or destroy 
the platform that God has given us. So we've seen God gives us a platform, all of us, no matter who you are, how old, how young, how small. And then our choices can either build or destroy those. The third truth we see is this. You leave a platform for those after you. You leave a platform for those after you. We're gonna see this in 1 Kings chapter 14 as to see kind of like the last memoir of Rehoboam's life. Now remember, Rehoboam was given this massive, incredible platform full of potential that if he would have just lived out, David's words to Solomon would have been used for amazing things, but he squanders it. Look with me at chapter 14, verse 21. Now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon reigned in Judah. He was 41 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city that the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Nama, the Ammonite. We'll get to her in a second. And Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They provoked him to jealousy with their sins that they committed. Listen to this, more than all their fathers had done. For they also built for themselves high places and pillars and ashram on every high hill and under every green tree. And they were also, listen, this is awful, male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations that the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. What do we see here? Rehoboam completely squanders the platform that God gives him. He walks away from the worship of his, of his grandfather and his ancestors. He walks away from the teachings of his grandfather and ancestors. And scripture even says he leads the people further away than previous generations. He completely squanders the platform that God had given him. And what begins to happen? The kingdom begins to crumble and split. Now this is where we get to nerd out a little bit on the history side of things. Um, you gotta remember that these aren't just fairy tales or anything like that. These are real people living in a real place in a real time. Israel was a real nation, a very real, powerful, prosperous nation. The moment Israel splits, it all changes. Israel's enemies, begin licking their chops, thinking this is our opportunity. Look at what happens in the rest of this chapter, verse 25, in the fifth year, fifth year. It didn't take long at all for the kingdom to come crumbling down. It didn't take long at all for the platform to be destroyed. In the fifth year of his reign, Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. Listen, he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He took away everything. He also took away all the shields of gold that Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made in their place shields of bronze, committed them to the hands of the officers of the guard who kept the door of the king's house. And as often as the king went into the house of the Lord, the guard carried them and brought them back to the guard room. So here's what happens. Historically speaking, the king of Egypt sees this as his opportunity. He begins marching his way up through the Middle East. He destroys fortified city after fortified city. Um, when you read in the, the Chronicles narrative of Rehoboam, you see that Rehoboam had actually sent his sons out to all the fortified cities to kind of be managers and leaders there. Those are destroyed. His sons come running back to Jerusalem because the world is falling apart around them. He makes his way up, makes his way up, gets to Jerusalem, tears into the house of the Lord, the temple, takes everything takes everything, then goes to the king's own house and takes everything. Now listen to this. Listen to the impact and the consequence of Rehoboam's choices and sin. Israel went from being an autonomous, prosperous, powerful nation, now split into two with 10 tribes being Israel, Benjamin and Judah being the southern kingdom of Judah where Rehoboam's at. And Judah ends up becoming part of, of the Egyptian king's kingdom. Basically what I mean is this, Rehoboam begins paying tributes to the Egyptian king just to stay alive, powerful and prosperous. to now a pawn of a pagan king. He inherits and is given this incredible platform. And what does he do? He throws it all away. Now don't miss this. This is an important, important part. 
It says that uh, the king of Egypt takes the golden shields of Solomon. Now, these shields that Solomon had made were a status symbol. They were a status of Israel's power and prosperity. It is estimated that these would have been worth in the hundreds and hundreds of millions. I'm talking priceless type of artifacts, right? So the king of Egypt comes and takes them. And what does Rehoboam do? Replaces them with bronze replaces them with bronze. Now he's so insecure about it that he can't just leave it be. He replaces them with bronze and then he's so insecure about that that he doesn't even leave them hanging out there 24 seven. They're out there briefly while he is coming and going and then taken back and put in a closet. Why? Because they're not the real thing. I think about this church and I ask you this question. Are you leaving a platform of gold or a platform of bronze? Are you leaving a legacy of gold for those who will come behind you or one of bronze? You see, here's the thing about bronze. It looks like gold. It's shiny like gold. You can see your face in it, but it's worthless. It's worthless. The other thing that bronze um, is different than gold is this. It's on the regular basis, Rehoboam would have had to have had servants go out and shine the shields to keep them looking like gold. And then he didn't even keep them out there. Listen to this this morning, church. Satan is a brilliant con artist. Satan's a brilliant con artist. We have the opportunity of a golden platform that God has given us. Yet what does Satan do? He sells us bronze and makes us think that it's the real thing. But what we don't realize is just like the bronze shield is we now have to work 10 times harder to maintain the cheap knockoff platform that Satan has given us. How many of us in this room this morning and watching online are currently settling for the cheap knockoff of a life that Satan has sold us, never ever noticing or realizing that God is standing here saying, here's what I made you for. Here's what I made you to do. Here's the impact you could have. Here's the platform that I have for you. You see, Satan doesn't have to get super clever He sees that you want a diamond, what does he do? He gives you something that looks like a diamond. It's shiny like a diamond. It feels like a diamond. But what happens when you drop it on the ground? It shatters, why? Because it's not a diamond. Never settle for the cheap knockoff of a platform that Satan offers when God offers something that is so much more real, so much more powerful. Because you see the consequences of Rehoboam's actions and choices would be felt for generations. You know, what we do with our platform doesn't just impact us. It impacts everyone around us. If you're a dad or a mom in here this morning, don't ever underestimate or downplay the power of the platform you have in your kids' lives. God has put us in in our children's lives to point them towards Jesus. And I know this, I don't want to leave a bronze legacy for my kids. I don't wanna leave a bronze legacy for those who will come behind me. I want to leave a platform of gold. Well, what does that look like practically? You ready? You ready? Here it is. I don't care if I leave a massive 401k for me to live off of, and I'm not just saying this, I don't care if there's this massive estate for my kids to inherit. What does it matter if I leave a legacy of bronze thinking it's gold and my kids walk away from their faith? What does it matter if I give my kids wonderful memories and vacations, but I never point them to Jesus? I'm gonna try to not get choked up as I say this because this is how passionate I am about this. Dads, listen to me. I will know I have left a legacy of bronze when my little girl and my son love Jesus more than anything else. I'll know I've left a legacy of gold when, when my kids hopefully get married to the person that God has for them and then my grandkids love Jesus more than anything else. That is a platform of gold. Rehoboam inherited a platform of gold and then he leaves a platform of bronze. Whatever platform God has given you, whether it's at school, it's in your home, it's in the workplace, he's given it to you to leave a legacy of gold and gospel impact, not one of bronze. You see, you look at Rehoboam's mom, we just talked about her, Nama the Ammonite. There's no doubt that she pointed her son towards pagan worship. There's no doubt. You look at his dad, Solomon, who invited that type of pagan worship. There's no doubt 
that Rehoboam followed the example of his parents. Pastor Rick said this several weeks ago and it was so great. Whatever we do in moderation, our kids might do in excess. Rehoboam lives that out. He leads God's people further away from God than anybody before him. I just wonder this morning, parents, spouses, college student, young person, what platform has God given you? And what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? Don't squander the platform God has given you. And ask the band to come up. And as we do, I'm gonna close with kind of this, this final word picture, I guess you could say, of, of the impact of a platform. When I think of, you know, something small or seemingly insignificant having an impact, I think of water, this massive ripple effect. Um, growing up, I love going to uh, the lake, Lake Lanier, and, you know, boating and tubing and skiing and, and all sorts of stuff. When I was in high school, family got a boat and um, it was just, it was just so much fun. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, one particular day though, we were uh, docking it. My dad was went to get the truck to back the trailer down. And me and my mom, my sister were in the boat cleaning things up. And then there's another pontoon boat at the stock. And uh, this guy came in on a big old, big old boat. And uh, I guess he was ticked off that there wasn't room for him to dock. I don't know. I don't know, it was no wake zone, whatever. Well, he turns around, he guns it out of there. Massive boat. And if you've been on the lake, you'll appreciate the weight of this. Um, Massive boat takes off out of there, leaves, I'm not exaggerating, a three to three and a half foot wake in his path, right? And I, we're in the boat, we see it coming and there's nothing we can do. My dad's just watching from the shore. I'm not exaggerating when I say I almost like had my arm like literally snapped in half trying to keep our boat from like tumping over onto the dock. Um, the poor uh, people in the pontoon boat, there's a lady in the wheelchair. She about went over into the lake. I mean, it was just this awful, awful scene. And thinking about the sermon and platforms and impact, I was reminded of the story because of this. That man, one boat, took off, he was gone, gone. And here we were left to deal with the impact, the ripple effect of his actions and choices. You see, every single one of us in this room, one day, just like that boat, we will be gone and out of here. And I wonder what impact, what ripple effect, what platform are we leaving behind? One of massive destruction, (laughs) one of bronze or one of gold that points people to Jesus because God gives us a platform to put him on it. So I ask you the question that I asked at the beginning again, what platforms do you have? If you're taking notes, maybe you wanna begin listing those out and and writing those out. Sometimes it's just helpful to write it out and see it. What platforms has God given you? And as you list them out, put God on those platforms. Well, how do you do that? What does it look like this morning? Very practically, in order to put God on the platforms that he's given you, maybe that means you need to first start by confessing some sins before the Lord. You need to repent. Say, God, I'm sorry for the way I'm living. God, I'm sorry for not having you on the platform. God, I want you on this platform. You see, ultimately pride was Rehoboam's downfall. There was. And I wonder how many of us this morning, if we were humble enough and honest enough would say, you know what? We struggle with the same thing. I know I do. I struggle with the same exact thing. Remember scripture teaches us that pride comes before the fall. See the platform and platforms that God has given you are to be used for his glory and his honor. So maybe tonight your first step is to come down to the, to the stairs, to this altar area when we sing here in a little bit and you spend time in prayer before God and say, God, I confess my pride. I've been putting myself on the platform and I no longer want to do that. I wonder this, sir, what would your family look like if you put God on the platform of your life? Ma'am, what would your family look like? What would your workplace, what would your school What would our church, our community look like if the body of Christ, rather than living for our own glory and to put ourselves on the platform of our lives, put God on it first? I ask you another question. What voices are you listening to? Remember who or what we listen to will shape who we become. 
Are there influences in your life that you need to get rid of? Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're like, you know what? I need to take a social media or a news fast. I just need to quit listening to that. I need to get that toxic junk out of my life and out of my mind and out of my heart. Maybe you need to put up some healthy biblical boundaries on some friendships that you've got because you know that they're young and foolish. They're not pointing you towards Jesus. Maybe you need to put some healthy biblical boundaries on on a family relationship, whatever it might be. Because remember, the people we listen to will shape who we become. If you're in this category, I want to talk to you this morning. It's this. Find a godly mentor. If you're a young person, find somebody that can pour into you and point you to Jesus. If you're an older person, find a young person that you can pour into and point them to Jesus. We never know the impact we can have. And I ask you this last question. Are you on the platform or is Jesus? You see, you can't put someone on the platform that you don't know. If you've never given your life to Christ, I can promise you this, you are living, you are living in a cheap knockoff version of the life that God has for you. You know, you're thinking, well, pastor, my life's great. Everybody's healthy, making a lot of money, very successful at work. That's fine, that's fine. That's not bad things, but I can promise you this. You're settling for a cheap knockoff. You're settling for a cheap knockoff. Don't waste the life that God has given you chasing your own platform. It always fails. But as we talk about the kings, we can't go without mentioning the perfect and good king, King Jesus, who never, ever fails. And he saw me and my sin and my brokenness. And he sees you and your sin and your brokenness. And he says, I want to get involved. I want to give you freedom. I want to give you life. I want to give you purpose. And he did so when he came and lived a perfect sinless life. He died on the cross to take the punishment that I deserve and that you deserve. So we can have the opportunity to have a relationship with him. But the beauty of the gospel is this, he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he was raised from the dead, proving that he has power over sin and Satan and hell and death. He wants to offer us that same life. So if that's you this morning, you're thinking to yourself, I don't know if I've given my life to Christ. If you're in this room, we wanna have a conversation with you, whether it's after the service up here or in the connection room, Don't let a small walk or a conversation stand between you and making the best decision of your life. If you're online, you can let us know with a digital connect card or in the the chat. Put God on the platform of your life. So as you move into this time of invitation, I don't know how the Lord is, is working or moving in your life, but I just encourage you this. Take whatever steps are necessary to put God on the platform of your life. Maybe you're a dad and you need to come pray with your family. A husband, you need to come pray with your wife. Student, you need to come pray over your friends, whatever it might be. Put God on the platform he's given you. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time in your word. God, I just ask that you will use the teaching of your word to stir and change our hearts. God, I pray that we will walk away knowing that every platform you've given us, you've given us for your honor and your glory to put you on that platform. However, you are working in our hearts. I pray that we have the obedience to respond. Lord, and that your name has received all the honor and glory that it deserves. We love you. We praise you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Stand up as we begin to sing.